Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there's a lot going on in our world today, and sometimes it can be a bit stressful. In fact, uh, watching national or local news can be stressful as we read about shootings and senseless violence. Even weather and even sports can be anxiety-inducing. There's a lot of outside information, and sometimes that outside information and, and forces can threaten to drag us down or uh, change our mood or, or, or cause us to turn inward, maybe, or cause us to stress out and to turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms. We can sometimes get so wrapped up in our stuff and feelings or entertainment that we can do damage both to earthly relationships and to our relationship with our Lord. Well, Luke chapter 21 is a fitting, uh, in, fitting chapter for Advent. And as we think about the Advent or the, the coming of our Lord, that's both uh, good news for us because we know our Savior has come to rescue and to redeem and to fix. It's also, as this text points out, sobering news uh, because we realize that we have a purpose um, as an important day draws near, whether it be if you're getting ready for Thanksgiving or Christmas or you're getting ready uh, for uh, a game or whatever it may be or a test, as the day draws closer, you know you have to take things more seriously and get prepared. And we remember that Christ could return at any time and that, that, that there's an important, that is an important event and we want to be prepared. Well, Luke chapter 21 is all about Jesus preparing his disciples for when he's not with them, but preparing them for when he shall return. Because Jesus does promise to return, but in the meantime, he warns them and us for both bad news and trials. Now, Jesus wants to prepare the disciples for the future, but he's not telling them the future. Sometimes that's what we think about when we think about these things. Well, but Jesus' primary purpose is not really to give us a, a sneak peek or the news before the news happens. Rather, Jesus does want us to know that troubles and persecutions will happen. When troubles happen is not what's important. Holding on to Jesus whenever they happen is important. And, and Jesus also says that, furthermore, actually, these hardships will actually advance God's kingdom. God works through trials and temptations, and his kingdom is advanced in these things. Now, whenever the New Testament, whether it's Jesus or Paul or whoever, whenever they bring up the future, things they often bring up things like wars, rumors of wars, famines, tragedies, etc., the New Testament is intentionally not specific. There are rarely any dates or specific times or names given. There's a few exceptions, and our text is one of them. And in these cases where specifics are given, it's most certainly not talking about our time or about North America or Europe or any of that. Actually, the only city mentioned is Jerusalem. The only specific time mentioned is within the lifetime of the apostles. Jesus' exact words are, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass, pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus is basically swearing by the heavens and the earth. Now that might sound funny. Why is Jesus swearing? He tells us not to. Well, Jesus is actually in control of the heavens and the earth, so it makes sense for him. He can actually swear by them. You and I, we can't change anything, so it doesn't even make sense for us to swear by it. Um, but he's swearing that all that he's talked about here will take, happen before the generation that he was talking to died. Now, do you remember back in the Old Testament how Moses told the nation of Israel it would have to wait 40 years to go into the promised land. If you remember, that was a punishment for that generation's lack of faith. They, 
that generation did not demonstrate faith even when the promised land was right in front of them. They wouldn't follow God's instructions or, or march into the land despite Yahweh's promises. Well, Jesus' prophecy really operates a lot like Moses' one. Jesus predicts that destruction will come to that particular generation for its lack of faith. We said many in uh, Moses' day did not demonstrate faith when the promised land was right in front of them, but many in Jesus' day did not demonstrate faith when the promised one was right there in front of them. And so Jesus uses the example of trees and uh, with which the disciples were familiar, like any gardener familiar with his or her particular bush, plant, or tree, there's signs you look for. How do you know when you'll start getting fruit? Well, you watch for the bud and the flower, and then you watch for the fruit to ripen. For instance, when I watch my raspberries, I look for those signs. Now, I don't know exactly what calendar date that the raspberries will be ready or will ripen. However, when I see the buds, I, or the, the followed by the flowers, I start paying closer attention to my bushes. And when I can see full-grown green raspberries, then I start looking at their progress pretty much daily. Well, Jesus tells the disciples to look, to watch the signs he describes. Jesus told them earlier in the chapter that these particular signs he's describing to them would be that they would be brought before synagogues, governors, and kings. The disciples would be thrown into prison, and Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies. However, instead of giving up, they were to witness. Jesus says, lift your head up, because the day of your redemption is drawing near. So that they don't need to, what he's trying to help them avoid is freaking out when these bad things happen, but actually be ready, because then is exactly when they should witness and the day of redemption is drawing near. Uh, when these things take place, they should not panic, but rather get ready for God to do work. Jesus is telling the disciples that God will use even hardships and trials to advance the kingdom of God. And still today, Jesus does the same sorts of things. Jesus, our, our Father's plan, often works in the midst of trials and tribulations. So when we are enduring trials, persecution, hardship, how should we respond? Well, Jesus doesn't tell us to avoid persecutions or trials. We should not kick and scream when bad things happen or bellyache like those Israelites in the wilderness. When you face trials, don't panic. Jesus has warned us so that we won't be thrown off our game. Instead, we are to prepare to endure hardship, to lift our head up, you might say, as Jesus says, and to faithfully give witness to our Savior. Here's a, a very simple summary, a W summary with three W words. Jesus warns, don't worry, just witness. Jesus has not told us exactly what kinds of trials or persecutions or personal hardships we will endure. He said we will, we will have some. He's not told us which, but he has told us how to respond. Unlike the Israelites at the promised land, we are not to necessarily march into the land and wage war. After all, if our Savior refused when he was unjustly jailed, tortured, and crucified, then uh, I think it be, would behoove us to act in a similar manner. Because after all, our war is not with flesh, or with armies or nations, but with spiritual powers and principalities. We are also told not to, we are not told, we are not told to guard our land or possessions. In fact, if we look elsewhere in the New Testament, we have more instructions to give them away than we do to guard them. But we should guard our hearts and our lives. We are to take care, and that's what this says, the text says to take care but not take care of our stuff. We are to take care how we live. Our lives, your life, 
is more important than your stuff. Our conduct and, and, and our witness to Christ is more important than our rights. Jesus says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipations and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day may come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So there's a couple of warnings here. The first one is don't be weighed. It's actually the second one, but it's more simple, so I'm taking it first. Don't be weighed down by drunkenness. Jesus is warning us not to let the pleasures of this world be what we live for. You see, we're, we're not living for the weekend. We're living for Christ. Now, drunkenness includes alcohol, but it includes you know, all kinds of types of activities um, or other pleasures, which, again, at, when, whenever they're taken out of moderation or out of their proper context can become a serious problem. That could include buying stuff. Or, or sexual pleasure, or entertainment, or even just generally friendship with the world. We're, we're warned not to find our solace or our identity in, in our feelings or our stuff or the things we can attain. Instead, we try, try, instead, try bringing your stress or your feelings to God and find comfort in him. When tempted to do something you should not, um, get talk, about, talk with your Lord. It may be challenging to do, but bring those problems to the Lord and ask for his help instead of trying to fix things yourself. Also, it's important to make God's word a gotta have. One of those, I gotta have this. I gotta have God's word in my life, or maybe even in just every day. He also encourages to pray, and we can pray instead of complaining, or we just had Thanksgiving, we can give thanks instead of, of complaining, and we can confess our sins in, instead of wallowing in them. So that means instead of just sticking in your sin and saying, oh, oh who cares, or oh, I'm, I'm so terrible, but I'm just going to keep going, you know, uh, we, instead of wallowing in our sins, when we come to our senses, we admit that we have said and done and thought things we should not have. Jesus also tells us, the second warning, or first, also tells us not to be weighed down by dissipation, which unless you're an English major, is probably confusing. But if something dissipates, it scatters. For instance, fog dissipates when the sun shines brightly on it. The fog is not substantial enough to stand up to a little opposition, a little bad news. Well, Jesus warns us against having an unsubstantial faith, one that really isn't very deep or, or uh, steadfast. A faith that is not very meaningful will disappear when a little pressure is applied. So we must, we must watch carefully not to be weighed down by things or pleasures of this world. Now, because the reality is, is that um, bad news can wear away at our faith, especially, you know, we, we all hear bad news, but if we let it get to us, uh, if we focus on it instead of Christ too much, it can, uh, it can set our mood, it can define who we are. But as Christians, why settle? Why settle for bad news? Why settle for bad news when we have the good news? There may be bad news. There, there always is. But the good news of Jesus is greater than our troubles and our sins and our trials. The forgiveness of Jesus is, is more important than anything else you'll hear on the news. It may be important, the news, but far more important is the good news of our Lord and Savior. There's nothing wrong with watching the news. There's nothing wrong with finding a little bit of enjoyment in life in the proper context. But, but if we don't watch our lives carefully, pleasures, or on the other end, troubles, will become a problem because we're sinners. We have hearts that are prone to sin. We're prone to overusing or idolizing even good things. So we have to 
take care and be on our guard or watch, as Jesus says, not to let either pleasures or troubles drag us down or become what's most important. Rather, we have a better center. We have something much better, the good news. Being connected to the good news of our Lord and Savior allows us to have patience and faith. Because Jesus is not giving us less than what the world offers, he's here to give us more than what the world can offer. And there's, there's lots of, of troubles and pleasures and, and information out there, but we come here to hear that Jesus is leading us to a better life. We need that reminder constantly that Jesus cares for us. He cares about us and the troubles that we are enduring. He forgives us. He loves us and he leads us. He will. He may not be here physically with us in the same way that he was with the disciples, but he's coming back. And he, he will always guide and lead us with his Holy Spirit. We can trust that Jesus is far greater than our troubles, our trials, and even the pleasures of this world. He will overcome our sins, and he will deliver us to eternal life in the king, his kingdom through his resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.